All right, here we go. Hold your ears, folks. It's showtime. Three, two, one, live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Duck, and man, how about this recession stuff, huh? I mean, how does it compare to other recessions, and what can we learn if we do go back and look at mistakes from the past? Here to dive into history books, we welcome from the Don't Retire, Graduate podcast, CFP Eric Brotman. Plus, from Earn and Invest, Doc G. And the financial writer ready to bring the wit, it's Paulette Perhatch. But that's not all. Our annual trivia competition is coming to a big close. Which worthy warrior will win today's tantalizing trivia in the waning weeks of wantonly wonderful trivia warfare? Really, Joe? We let you write one show open again, and that's it? That's what you bring? Man, rough. And now, a guy who's far better at leading money discussions than he is at alliteration, it's Joe Saul Cihai. Hey everybody, welcome to Friday. I'm Joe Saul C. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And uh, Paulette, Doug's right, you're gone one week and I get all crazy with the words. I mean, I thought I was mean to Doug, but man, that was rough. <laughs> got a lot of breath, I got lightheaded there. Seeing if he could make it. Well, we're going to help everybody make it because I don't know if you guys know this, but the stock market's been all over the place lately and inflation also been crazy and uh, recession, no recession. Well, we're going to have a fun chat looking back historically and seeing what we should, what lesson should we learn, which lesson shouldn't we? And here to do that, let's introduce all the voices in this shindig, as mom says. We will start off with, uh, man, I don't have the guy in the bunker. I don't have the dude across the table today. So let's start in Chicago, where Mr. Earn and Invest joins us, the master of the trivia challenge to the thousandth degree, Doc G, Mr. Jordan Grummet. How are you, man? I am good, and I'm getting closer. I have to tell you, my my trivia is not nearly as off as it was six months ago. I am building. Did you win last time? No, no, no. It was three or four times ago, but I was oh. more within like 10 to 50% as yes. opposed to a 1,000 times off. So I'm getting better. <laughs> exactly. We'll see if that continues. And the woman keeping... Uh, keeping life in Gainesville, Florida going. I don't know. What do I do, Paulette? <laughs> Paulette Perhatch is here. Yeah, we can introduce the voices in my head. Um, yeah, uh, no, and who made the writer who made the big move to uh, to save money in Gainesville, where you also actually can spend money, it turns out, unfortunately. So who knew? Who knew? Damn it. You have like a magnet, though. If there's a place to spend money in Gainesville, you'll go right there, won't you? Oh, I will find those $15 cocktails and I will drink them. I feel like Facebook ads are good enough for me. Like, I'm like, damn it, Facebook, take my money. Okay, I need those pajamas, those Michigan State, I don't know, whatever. And the guy who's wearing pajamas as he podcasts with us, I'm sure, because he could do this in his sleep, from Don't Retire Graduate, Eric Brotman's here. How are you? Good to be here. My first trivia challenge, and I'm prepared to take down the competition. Wait, you have not done a trivia challenge with us yet. I, I have not. I'm the new kid on the block, and, and you're going to give me a world today. We'll see what happens. We will see. That's exciting, Doug. I didn't know that about Eric. That Who's he, has he playing him. for today, Joe? <laughs> well, I'll <laughs> tell you, Doug. He's, <laughs> this is the most important thing we'll talk about all day, which is I think that Doc G is so bad at this historically that he's got to play for OG because he's leading. It's like the OG handicap. Yep. Put a giant handicap on OG. Yep. Yes. Which yeah. means that Eric's going to play for Mr. Penzo today. So, yeah. We're making OG pick last for dodgeball. How's that make you feel, Jordan? <laughs> you know, if you're going to be bad at something, trivia, not, that's fine. Brand new people to this podcast are wondering, what the hell does this have to do with recessions, inflation, all this stuff? We, oh. we got, I think we got to get moving. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, all of your faces. Just, I'm so <laughs> proud. <laughs> Our piece today comes to us from the Surviving and Thriving blog and the uh, Plutus Lifetime Achievement winner, Donna Friedman, 
who's amazing in Alaska and has written some great stuff. And this is fantastic. This isn't your grandparents' recession, she writes. She says, when the going gets tough, it's tempting to invoke our grandparents and their tribulations during the Great Depression. I'm about to commit cultural heresy, Donna writes. A lot of their advice wouldn't help us. And then she dives into the Great Depression and really how this might be a little bit different. And I want to start with the certified financial planner in the room, Mr. Brotman. How is this different than the Great Depression? Well, it's, it's different in a number of ways. It's always different. I think first and foremost, we are not currently in a depression. We are in a recession. I don't care who tells you we're not. That's political spin. I believe we're already in a recession. And what economists like to do is they like to announce that we've been in recession already for six to nine months after it started. Uh, and so they'll tell us it's already rained like a meteorologist after the streets are wet. The thing that's different right now, fundamentally, I think, is that there's nothing particularly wrong. I know this is heresy too, but there's nothing particularly wrong with equities. The issue right now is that fixed income hasn't been a place to hide. And so, you know, this is the first time since 1931 that equities and bonds have had this deep a dive at the same time. It's only happened four times in the last 95 years, and this is the worst since 31. So if there's something that we can say is similar to the times of the Great Depression, it would be that. But fundamentally, inflation's here. I think it's here to stay. Uh, and I know we've got some varied opinions on that on the, on the line today. But I don't think that the recession that we're in is likely to be one of the, one of the great, long, deep recessions that we've got. I, I think we're going to see some, some type of recovery after the midterm elections, uh, not to wax political. But I, I think there is going to be some certainty after that that will at least drive us one direction or the other. Wow, we get a weather forecast and everything from Mr. Brotman to kick it off. Nice job. I want to ask about your history of recessions. Paulette, how many of these uh, recessionary shindigs have you been through? Okay, ask the certified financial problem next. Um, <laughs> I have been through one major one, um, which was when I bought a house when I was really young in Florida in 2005 and then got to uh, enjoy the... 2008 recession. That's like the, you know, the big one that I remember from my life. It was actually a little strange because I was in Peace Corps from 2008 to 2010, even though I still owned the house. So I kind of missed out on the actual like on the ground oh. everyday experience of it. But it affected even the co-op that I worked for in the Peace Corps when they were trying to sell the embroidery that they did. And it was so wild to see something be so global. I hadn't had that experience before. And it's very scary. How did it affect the embroidery? So my host mom, she would get up, take the 5 a.m. bus, go to the Capitol and sell can you tell to everybody, a store. Can you tell everybody, by the way, what country you're in, where you're at? In Paraguay. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so they had an embroidery called Alpoe. So she would go. So we they were the artisans in my town. And then they would take it to the Capitol to sell to tourists and locals and, you know, the stores just weren't buying because they weren't selling anything there. What's interesting, Eric, just back to you for a second. Paulette talks about that. And I remember people struggling, obviously, with employment, tons of people. I was in Detroit, which, you know, really took a lot of the brunt of that recession. We haven't had a huge problem with employment yet. So a lot of people out there with this recession still have paychecks. That's a big difference. Well, it depends how you define a problem with employment. There's still a lot of underemployment, and unemployment numbers look good, but that's because people have stopped looking for jobs. It's been dubbed the Great Resignation, where people have not only stopped working, sometimes voluntarily, but they're not even trying to go back. And at some point, that can't persist. So unemployment numbers right now look favorable, but it's not because everyone's found jobs. It's because people have stopped looking for them. And that's a new and profound way to look at those statistics. I think statistics are, are only as good as the raw data. And the raw data doesn't suggest that, that that's a, a strong spot for us. I just had like a layperson question. So they just measure, they don't measure people without jobs, but people looking for jobs for unemployment? Yes. And it's, okay. and it's about first time claims in most cases. It's about mm -hmm. who's looking for work this week that wasn't looking for work last week. You see trends based on that. When a big company or a, a, an industry has major layoffs, you'll see the unemployment spike. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, some of that's seasonal too. So if you're in an area where tourism is very large, you know, you might have seasonal unemployment and other things that, that can easily be not only predicted, but weathered. 
Hmm. This is a little different. People have, uh, I think, proactively decided they're not working anymore. There are people who are retired. Don't these people have shopping problems? Well, they, they've retired prematurely. And if for anyone who retired, you were talking about buying a house in 05 and sort of getting clobbered in 08. People who retired in 05 had a ugly wake-up call three years later. Uh, and I think that's happening now again. I think some people left the workforce during COVID and either haven't gone back or, or have chosen not to go back. And the further you get from employment, the less employable you are. And so it's it's a problem that's snowballing, in my opinion. Doc G, how many recessions you've been through? So I have vague memories of the 80s and the inflationary crisis. My father had just died. My mom had just got life insurance and actually started deploying that life insurance right then, talking about bonds returning, what, 15 18%. Oh, yeah. I think she put a bunch of money in the Magellan Fund. She actually did exceedingly well because of the timing. As an adult, I, of course, went and moved from one financial advisor to another and must have been in 99 or 2000, walked my big check into Fidelity, grabbed the first advisor they were willing to give me from the desk and put everything into tech. And of course, it dropped like a rock uh, during the early 2000s. You know, I remember 2007, 2008, but I was in a very different place. And I think this brings up some of what Eric was talking about. What's different this time is that fixed income isn't as safe as we have thought it would be, our bond allocations aren't returning what we were hoping they were. But in 2008, I was having a steady income, right? I was a very employable physician. So what happened then is as the stock market crashed, I started buying foreclosed real estate. So, you know, I think what Eric is talking about now is also kind of scary about the unemployed um, and those who've kind of given up on employment because there are no guarantees, because you don't know what equities are going to do, because you don't know what fixed income is going to do, the only really solution you have is creating your own income, right? So if you're young and employable, these times are very much more manageable than if you're either past that retirement age or you are in a field where your skills don't lend yourselves to new types of employment if you lose your job. I mean, those are the people who are really suffering now. So the only guarantee you have is be employable, be able to make money, because then you can stave off everything that's happening right now. But that seems more difficult, Paulette, I would think, uh, during this this kind of time. Like, I feel like it's those people at the bottom of any work pyramid that are the first first to go. Like, we stop hiring. We just mm -hmm. go, no, I can't hire anybody today. So if you're somebody in college today, like, I wonder how they're taking it. Yeah, but I think that the thing is they're not as afraid to go back, you know, live back home. I think people are more used to these giant upheavals. I'm an adjunct professor now, and just the way that I was introduced this year to the students and how much different it is because they've all lived through the pandemic. It is a really scary time, and people just want things to get back to normal. But, I, yeah, it must be really terrifying to to kind of go into – the workforce at this time. But I think also there's more of an awareness of side hustles, of the ability to create your own brand, create your own business, create your own marketing on social media. So I think in a lot of ways, younger people are more creative than ever as far as getting a paycheck in goes. Eric, how many of these have you been through? Professionally, I've been through two. So I, I remember the late 80s as a teenager. And I remember the gas lines in the 70s as a kid. But I went through Y2K uh, fortunately, I was not buying all tech in 99. Although for folks who just held the S&P 500 at that time, they were 40% tech without knowing it. So yeah, they yeah. sort of got clobbered without their knowledge. You know, you look forward to today and you see some of those huge companies that have overpowered those indices again. And so that's that's one of the reasons why I, I like to beat on indexing as a, as a pure strategy. However, I went through Y2K, I went through 08 or 09, they were very different because Y2K really was uh, specific to a sector, whereas 08, 09, there were only two asset classes I can think of that actually thrived in 08, 09. One was managed futures. It was commodities and some natural resources. And the other was permanent life insurance, which I know you right. and I like to go right. round and round on, but it, it actually did pretty well then. Right now, there have been very few places to hide. The real estate that I have liked in the last couple of years has been supply chain, warehousing, distribution center, industrial real estate. It hasn't been shopping malls, for heaven's sakes. And so, you know, there, there are opportunities out there, but you really have to dig for them. 
Doug, were you and I working together in, in 99, 2000? That was later, wasn't it? No, I think we were. Maybe 2003, it was right 2004. right when we got started. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Those years, I remember, were incredibly difficult as an advisor just because every day for two years, it just felt like it kept going down a little bit more, down a little bit more, down a little bit more, down a little bit more. And people's propensity was to do the wrong thing. And I think that when we look back here, Paulette, let's talk a little bit about what you think maybe the wrong thing would be. What's the wrong lesson you think people might be learning through this right now? Well, knowing what I know now, it's to sell everything freaking out. (laughs) Nice job. Yay, I learned. (laughs) I think because our lives are so short, but the market is long, we don't see the big picture. We just see what it feels like right now. And what has helped me by getting financial educated through no fault of my own is to hear how much you guys talk about, you know, the history of the market and thinking about it in these like, you know, the century or so. And so just saying like, okay, no, this is normal. You know, it's like if a little kid started crying because the sun went down, it's like, nope, that happens every night. Just let's wait. And then tomorrow morning, it'll come back up. I love that analogy, Doc G. Another thing you think might be a bad lesson people can learn right now? I think the bad lesson is to live in the moment, especially if you are in the accumulation stage and you're starting to get to the point where you have some extra you're really starting to think about risk mitigation. And I think this is, you know, it's always best to think about this right before you're in the midst of recession. But you really want to start thinking about your asset allocation, your diversification, and your revenue streams kind of early on in the game. And the idea actually, especially gearing up for stuff like this, is not to make insane gains. It's actually risk mitigation. It's how are you going to protect what you have and have modest growth. And I think if you come at it with that mindset, especially after you have accumulated some Uh, you are going to weather these storms a lot better because the idea is you really don't want to be making as many huge decisions right now. You really want to have been thinking about these things before you got into the hot water. This sounds like a a decision you made when you walked into that office in 99 or as a result of walking into that office, putting everything in tech and then realizing that that might have been the worst move of all. Well, I had no flipping idea what I was doing. And again, being young and having a little bit of cash – I was just ready to jump on whatever wave was going at the moment. But what you learn when you've been beat up enough and when you start studying this is often those waves are short-lived. And so you've got to start thinking about, am I investing for short-term or long-term? And am I excited about what's happening and what everyone is talking about right now? Or am I excited about something that really long-term can give me some modest returns that can protect all that I've accumulated that can enhance my life as opposed to I know by now that I'm probably not going to hit it big with one investment, right? I'm not going to go from zero to millions because I decided to jump into that tech bubble. And and that's kind of the different outlook I have now compared to when I was kind of in my early 20s. I want to define something that you said earlier, though, because you said don't live in the moment. And I think that based on everything that you said, I think you're talking about not planning your money in the moment, like not planning your money based on that. Correct. In terms of lifestyle, I think you're talking about mitigating risks so you can live in the moment, right? So you could continue to just be. I think we're talking about the difference between our economic lives and our personal lives. And I think Mm. our economic lives do need to be planned out so that we can live in the moment, um, which sometimes means spending money and a lot of times means saving money. But yeah, I think from an economic standpoint, we have to be a little bit more conservative and risk mitigation is something that we don't talk about enough. That's what's going to help us out mostly in these unforeseen futures, right? Because we really don't know what's going to happen with this recession, just like we didn't really know it was going to happen in 2002 and we really didn't know it was going to happen in 2008. Um, The best thing we can do is kind of prepare ourselves for all sorts of different muddy waters. Eric, let's have the CFP get a little nerdy for us, if you don't mind. Which is, you know, when Doc G- <laughs> how about a, how about a lot nerdy? Can I go a lot nerdy? Can I take a lot nerdy, Alex, for a thousand? Yeah. No, I want to ask you though. When he talks about risk, I remember two thousand to two thousand two, and also the lead up to what Paulette's talking about about the next recession, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and man, everybody has huge risk tolerance. Until this Mm -hmm. stuff hits. Everybody does. They will look you in the eye all day and go, oh, no, 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 no. Let's get just a little more. 
Let's get just a little more. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, those were the first people, by the way, I don't know about you, but those were the first people calling me back when I was a financial planner, when things started to go south. Oh, what should we do? What should we, oh my goodness, are we taking too much? What are we, what are we, oh my, oh, oh boy. Well, you, you hit it right on the head. And that's the pendulum that swings. And I'll nerd out a little bit. The pendulum swings between greed and fear, back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, Warren Buffett said it best. He said, it's, it's best to be fearful when others are greedy and best to be greedy when others are fearful. And he's absolutely right. What tends to happen is we, we get a sense, it's FOMO. We get a sense that our neighbors are getting rich and we're not. And you have this tendency to chase something that's already happened. And that definitely happened in the tech bubble. And it also happened in real estate in the mid 2000s. Um, but it's happened a number of times. You tend to feel like I've missed out on something and I have to play catch up. It's like being the guy who shows up an hour late at the bar and does four shots right away to catch up to his friends. It's never a good strategy, but people do it. Uh, uh, not me, of course, but some people might do it. Um, at, at any rate, when, when he's, that pendulum he's, swings. He's heard it's been done. You've heard it's, it's been, been done. done. I read about that in a journal <laughs> of some kind, some medical journal. They said it's bad. Uh, but the tendency is to jump in after it's already too late and then to jump out after the damage is done. I mean, routinely, routinely, human behavior leads us to do exactly the wrong thing at exactly the wrong time. I think Jordan said it best. He said that it's really about risk mitigation. The truth is, if you look at any portfolio over a period of time, it is more important to miss the big mistake, to miss the big loss than it is to catch the big gain. And I liken it to when the Titanic is crossing the Atlantic. If the Titanic had gone just a little slower and missed the iceberg, it would have had a better outcome. It's important to miss the big mistake. And that's what people run into over and over again. I think that's a great place to hit the pause button. I love the discussion that we've had about all the things that we shouldn't do and the dangers of, of comparing this to past recessions. I want to ask all of you after our break here, exactly kind of what your mindset is. We've got a little bit of your mindset, but I'd really like to go from the negative into the positive. How are you weathering the storm? What are you doing? And then what's your best advice for the people that out in our stacker community? But of course we got to put that all aside for a second because we have this epic trivia challenge that is coming to a head. We only have a few more sessions left and man, is it close? OG is leading our trivia challenge with 14 and a half points. Len is in second with 14. Of course, doc G that means you're playing the part of OG today. No pressure, but it's really close. And Eric, you're playing the part of Len. No pressure, but it's really close. And Paulette, who's been on a tear, I think Paulette's won three out of maybe the five sessions she's been in on, has brought the Paulette Paula Pant team back from the dead. Uh, <laughs> is it 10 and a half and really needs to keep that winning streak alive, Paulette, if right. uh, if you got a shot at this. So no pressure on anybody today when it comes when it comes to our trivia challenge. And by the way, for people that missed it, Doug, Doug I think I might have said this before. Did I tell you that our friend Eric in Detroit, Pastor Eric, has purchased a cake for the winner? We actually have the code. We have a cake. The guy that said he was going to give the winner a cake is, uh, why am I explaining to this? Because two of the three of you are not eating cake no matter what happens. But <laughs> That's right. I just realized. I, in the end, Joe and I get the cake. <laughs> I didn't know there was cake. Yeah, Eric, <laughs> the, the cake yeah, is a lie. I would have cheated a lot more if I knew there was cake. <laughs> That's right. I'd have been here sooner. Apparently, the cake is a lie. But what is isn't a lie is that we have trivia, and Doug's going to bring it right now, aren't you? Thought you'd never shut up, Joe. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And today, since we're talking about inflation and how historic this may be, I thought we'd have some trivia on the matter. Back in 1980, inflation was soaring to record levels, peaking at 14.6% in April of that year. So here's today's question. How many months did it take back then for inflation to retreat to any number below 5%? I'll be back with the answer right after I go and flake my mouth around some ice cream. Mm -hmm, yummy. Well, while Doug is contemplating the ice cream flavors, let's contemplate this one. Doc G, you're going first from 14.6% mm. in April of 1980. How many months did inflation take to get back below five? I have no clue. Um, and I have no memory say, of the time. You're just going to say a million? 
Yeah, no, no, no. So it's somewhere less than a million, somewhere more than one. Um, I'm going to say 13 months. I think it took a while. Just over a year. All right. Uh, Mr. Brotman? I'll take 24 months. And you're thinking? I'm thinking it was it was two years at least. All right. Which, Paulette, what are you thinking? I'm going to go 25 then. <laughs> because he said at least. Is, yeah. is that why? And I was like, <laughs> since, you know, some of us are so young that we weren't alive back then, I have to go with the people who remember. That's twice as hurtful as it could have been, by the way. Yeah, she's like that. She, di- I'm telling you. Not only you, did she stab me in the ribs, but she called me old when she did it. Yeah, she does it with a serrated <laughs> knife sometimes. <laughs> Eric, welcome to our trivia challenge. Welcome to our trivia challenge. I could not have called her something uh, any any more uh, accurate than she called herself. Listen, so we're good. You guys, you guys have the money. I have the insults. That's how this works here. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> I wouldn't trade. And I have to say, I'd have to, I have to say, we've been playing this game long enough, Eric, that I wouldn't take it personally because we throw insults around the trivia more and more regularly. I feel like every week here, I would love to tell you who's right. We got uh, Doc G in at thirteen months, Eric at twenty four, Paulette at twenty five months. Who's right? We'll let you know in just a minute. Doc G, you're looking like the things move fast guy now at thirteen months. Yeah, I may be having a little remorse. The more I think about it, I think it probably is longer than 13 months, but oh well. <laughs> what can you do? I shot the moon. Yeah. The good news is you've got every you've got everything between 24 and a half months and what? Around uh uh around the t- uh, 18 18 months ish. But let's see. Let's see how I did. Feeling good? I I'm feeling pretty confident. Yes. If Paulette steals this, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be upset with her forever. But you know, she played it smart. She got to go last. Well, let's ask Paulette. How are you feeling about this? I'm feeling pretty good because I'm riding on the coattails of someone who seems like they know what they're talking about, which is where I like to be. <laughs> Perfect sucker. No, it's- <laughs> <laughs> that's it's how three the months. Game- <laughs> three months. Yeah. That's how the game is played. Doug, uh, who's gonna get this one? Hey there, stackers. I'm Master Inflator and denizen of the chill dairy delight aisle, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Today, I'm sharing trivia about inflation. I don't want to alarm anyone with today's trivia, though, because personally, I think things are really looking up for us. Truly. Like, you know, prices at the grocery store, those are up. Gas prices, super up. Back hair electrolysis, through the roof and through my shirt. All right, enough messing around. Let's get you a trivia answer. Back in 1980, there were lines at the gas pump. Jimmy Carter was president. The Soviets were intervening in Afghanistan. Eric Brotman was in elementary school. And gold prices were rocketing from $300 an ounce to a then record price of over $900 an ounce. Inflation peaked in April of that year at 14.6%. But how many months did it take for inflation to hit any number below 5%? Well, Joe, I'm just going to say that our strategy of having Doc G play for OG worked perfectly because he was incredibly wrong. (laughs) The Fed continued to raise interest rates for a year after the peak, but it still took nearly three full years, or to be exact, 33 months for inflation to drop below 5%, making Paul at our winner. Making it rain, woman. Cake is coming my way. Paulette continues the unlikely drive from way, way, way at the back when she took over to now. It's you know. comeback season. Ah, it's so good to be good at things that don't matter and terrible at everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Truly a joy. Oh, congratulations, though. Savor it, Paulette. Savor the win. Savor the win. Built on the back of uh, Mr. Brotman, I think. I think you can thank uh, Mr. Brotman. I'm so glad I could help, Paulette. I I will have, uh, let me have some of the icing, please. Okay, I'll mail it to you. Thank you. Hey, time to move into our second half of the show. The second half of the show is brought to you by Magnify Money. Eric, you know what happens when you go to stackybenjamins.com slash Magnify Money? My money grows. It, it does. Because yeah. those brick yeah. and mortar banks that most people bank at might not be best in class. Over 92% of the online banks ranked head-to-head 
at Magnify Money. So head to stackybenjamins.com slash Magnify Money so you can check out better savings accounts, better checking accounts, CDs, and all the above. And with the interest rates going up, maybe time to check that out right now. Stackybenjamins.com slash Magnify Money. All right. I mentioned... I mentioned two things I want to talk to you guys about. I want to start with really your mindset right now in this. And obviously you're as doc G and we'll start with you. You said, you know, it kind of depends on where you're at right in your life as to how you take this. And certainly all of our listeners are going to be in different places. So we can't comment on everybody, but what about you, man? What's your mindset around this? My mindset is, the person who can hold the bag longest wins. In other words, those who have some resources and some cushion, those who are well planned out are going to do fine regardless because the stock market eventually always goes up. So the question is, are you in a place where you can wait it out? I think for me, that's kind of helpful because we still have income. My wife still works, even though she doesn't have to. She likes to work. I still have some income from various sources. So that makes me feel incredibly stable because I don't have to draw down, right? So anyone who doesn't have to draw down, anyone who's not looking to their 401ks, Roth IRAs, or taxable accounts in order to sustain themselves, if you can avoid needing to use those things, uh, you can wait this out for a long period of time. So Your my first- mindset is... Your first thought process is protect your income stream is what I'm hearing. I think in this case, I'm lucky to have one. And I think for people who have an income stream right now, holding on to it until this resolves is a very reasonable way to make it through this. Paulette, how about you? Well, you know, being 40, I think that I'm not too old to get a sugar daddy um, or a sugar mama. (laughs) You know, I'm open minded. So that is going to be my strategy (laughs) if everything dries up. That's just perfect. She just heads to uh, TikTok and I, sometimes they come to me on Instagram. No, so um, I'm really focusing on my business. You know, I think people will always need writers, and it reminds me of when the lockdown first started, and I lost all of my clients. And because I have been investing in building a social media platform, I was able to go on social media and say, "Hey, I was one of the freelancers who lost their work," and. I remember just like 11 people retweeted it and my calendar filled back up. So, you know, relying on all these kind of invisible assets that aren't on the balance sheet. But if you have your own business, you've built your reputation, you've built your systems, you know, just really doubling down on that and remembering that you have control over getting work. And it's not that no one has work. It's that fewer people have work. So you might have to play the numbers game a little bit more, but just really focusing on your own, like within your locus of control and, you know, letting what else happens happen. Paulette, I really like what you're saying here, which is be good at your job is what I'm hearing, right? Focus on your skill set and trying to actually be good at what you do. Yeah. And and being a professional around whatever you do and that, you know, in that way, it's like when there's less work, the best people are going to get the work that is there. And I think that I let that fear kind of drive me into always bettering myself, taking LinkedIn learning classes and saying, okay, I I wanted to be an independent contractor and a freelancer. So like challenge accepted, I have to really work on that. And that's something that you can control. And so not wasting your energy on, on panicking. Can we vent about this for just a second, Paula? Because this, it always drives me crazy. Like whether you're a professional writer or a waiter at a restaurant, why the hell you wait for somebody else to train you to take control of your career instead of you like going to YouTube university and going, how can I be the best of all waiters out there? You know what I mean? I used to be like that though. I wasn't like that until I was 28. I think so many of us are. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I was like a total idiot in college. I think it's, it might, for me, I think it was entitlement and just that, like, I watched Beverly Hills now, which we know everything's going to go great. I'm going to get this fantastic internship. It's going to be fine. And then it's like, no, it's just like, I think we all have that like main character energy that is supported by capitalism and social media, which is one of the downfalls of social media. And one of, we have one a, of, one of, and we have an optimism bias. And I think you kind of, maybe it takes you getting your own butt kicked a little bit. To, I know that's what it took for me. And then to be like, okay, well, this isn't working. So let me see what else is out there. That was really the lesson that I needed. Doug, it just kind of reminds me of that Nick Saban TikTok we did uh, recently about, you know, you can choose. You can choose. You're going to be bad at this, decent at it, good at it, excellent or elite, right? I mean, you, you get to choose. And to Paulette's point, it might be a little hard. It might be a little difficult. 
Eric, what about your mindset as the professional? Cause I know, I know going through this twice when I was a planner, my hair went away. I worried nonstop. I'm fairly certain my liver function got a little worse. Um, what's your mindset through this? Well, at first, I'm going to agree with my colleagues here that um, the revenue side, the income side is important. And th- that if you are working to continue to work and, and hone that craft, and if you don't have a side hustle, it's a great time to try and, and create one. But just from an investment perspective, I'll, I'll take sort of that professional approach. There are only three kinds of people in the world. There's buyers, holders, and sellers. And we're not all just one of those three things. So here's what I mean. For folks in their 20s, 30s, 40s, like Paulette, sorry, Paulette, 40s, for those folks, they're buyers. You know, historically, these are folks who are adding to their 401k every check or adding to their IRA every year or adding to their their brokerage account every month or, or on a regular basis. And for buyers, the best thing that can happen is to have some volatility and some m- meaningful dips in the market because that's where you're actually creating value from dollar cost averaging. If you continuously have a market that only goes up there is no opportunity to take advantage of any of the volatility. So this is a great time for buyers. For holders, it means you're going to lose some time. So if you're planning to retire in three years based on what you're holding and you're not adding to those accounts in a profound way, your time frame, your timetable may be shifting. And these are the folks who might be working five or six years instead of three to hit that financial independence mark. And so I agree uh, that you want to hang on to that bag as long as you can and not quit. And then, then sellers. Now, these are the folks who are withdrawing from a portfolio. And when you withdraw from a portfolio, it's like picking fruit from, a, from an orchard of trees. And as long as you're picking the fruit, you can pick it every year. The problem is that when inflation goes up and when you start to see your portfolio go down, you, we have a tendency to chop branches off of the trees, not just to pick the fruit, which guarantees you less and less fruit in the future. So if you're a buyer, keep buying. If you're a holder, hang on. If you're a seller... Number one, hopefully you're already in a position where you've segregated your accounts. It is possible to be a seller in one account, a holder in another, and maybe even a buyer in a third. So you don't have to look at this as all or nothing. None of us are just one thing. So if you have accounts where you're adding money regularly, that's where you want to be a little bit more aggressive. When you have accounts that you're withdrawing from, you want to treat that with kid gloves. You want to know that you've got a meaningful stretch of time set aside, and I think that's five to ten years. Know where your money's coming from for the next five to 10 years, and then don't worry about the news du jour in the Wall Street Journal. And that's the way I would treat it. Doc G, Eric, looking at those three types of people, I know that you've talked about being financially independent. Would you see yourself more as a holder then or as a buyer? I definitely see myself as a holder. Um, Because I have some income, I sometimes buy But I've tried to set up assets that will support me for the rest of my life, regardless of what comes in from a few years ago. So if I have the luxury of buying, if I have some extra cash around, I will. Um, But I expect my assets to last. And so, again, I'm kind of lucky in the sense that we still have income, so we don't even have to test that theory. That's why I do so many squats, so my assets will last. (laughs) And they will. And and so that's the idea, right, is you got to flex those assets. Thanks, Joe. I did. I did. <laughs> At least Joe laughed. I laughed because oh. I did squats this morning, and right now my everything everything south of my stomach hurts like hell because uh, me and squats <laughs> just do not get along. It is it is a bad deal. But Eric, Doc G brought up something interesting earlier that I want to ask you about now when it comes to uh, diversifying our mm-hmm. investments. The right time to diversify your investment strategy probably isn't today, isn't right now. However, let's say that you know you're in the wrong place. Well, you're looking at me like you you don't like the way I phrased that question. It, it may be now, huh? Well, I, I think the best time to invest is always immediately. And the best time to diversify or do the right thing is always immediately. You can't improve on the wrong thing by continuing to do the wrong thing. And so while I don't think people should run out and suddenly rebalance everything, the time to rebalance usually is when some asset classes have gotten their teeth knocked in. Because what you're essentially doing, if you're maintaining balance and diversification, is you're buying the losers and you're selling the winners. And it requires fortitude to do that because we have a tendency to say, oh, I'm riding this ride all the way up and I'm, I'm scared of this one over here. But the fact is, if you're holding a portfolio, and and that could be not just investment assets that are stocks and bonds or cash, but it could be alternative assets, it could be real estate, it could be other things, the time to diversify, the time to do the right thing is always immediately. What am I solving for? If I'm a buyer like Paulette, what am I solving for? Staying aggressive? 
Yes, absolutely. Not not necessarily getting more so, but staying your course. If you're adding $1,000 a month to something, don't stop doing it because things have gone south. It's exactly the time where you'll benefit from the behavior. What am I what am I solving for if I'm chopping down limbs? If I'm a seller right now and I'm chopping limbs in my orchard? That's where you have to start figuring out how to live on less fruit or how to make more trees, which means that means going back to work. If you've quit, it means a side hustle. If you need a second job to prevent dipping into your portfolio assets, that's where you need the the top end to come in. That's where you need to make more money in other ways. Diversify your revenue as much as you diversify your investments. Paula, you've talked openly about adding to your target date funds as you go. Have you found yourself trying to accelerate that during the downturn to try to just keep pace? Are you keeping more money just in a holding tank? You're laughing at me. I'm laughing because I had to cancel my freaking payment this week because no. I overspent. Yeah. And I was like, okay, all right, here you are. Here you are, honey. All right. Yes. And I have, I'm coming off like spending a lot of money and I'm like, I'm chilling out a little bit, but yeah, it's, I have such a hard time keeping the big perspective because the, like, I have such a hard time with the what's right in front of my face skills. So I try to automate and I, I did my, I actually put a Instagram post up today and I said the five stages of that morning check of the bank account after you had a quote, great weekend. And it's like, Ooh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just trying to stay the course really and just doing what, what I said I would do. And I'll probably give myself a little raise at the end of the year. And I want to increase it with what that raise is. And so everything is pretty much as it is. I know that because things are getting cheaper, the best thing to do is just be to shove as much money as possible into the the market right now. Yeah. I, I just think historically, if you don't need the money for 10 years, this is, well, there's a lot of short-term pain. This is where mm. you come out the other side going, man, I'm glad I stayed aggressive. I'm so glad I stayed aggressive. I mean, I think it all begs the point that, yes, we don't know what's going to happen with this recession. We don't know how this recession is going to be different from other recessions or or what, when, how long it'll last, et cetera. But I think what we come and keep on coming back to is if you plan well from the start and you develop the good habits in the beginning and you're thoughtful before these big things happen, most of the time your plan actually is to stay the course. I totally agree. What agree. if you're a chaos monster? <laughs> <laughs> And I think that's a great place for us to leave it. Hey, guys, thank you so much for this fantastic discussion. Just so many takeaway points, I think, for our Stacker community. Let's find out what's going on where you guys all work. Uh, we'll have our guest of honor, Mr. Brotman, go last. We'll go ladies first. Paulette, what's going on in the writer's community? So at Powerhouse Writers this week, we're talking about getting organized, which is really fun because I'm designing a piece of software called the Writer's Mission Control Center. So it's oh, the sweet. organized is really, you know, all the information you have to track in your business. It took me forever to realize like, oh, I need to track my opportunities because I'm just like any other business as a writer. So we're working on that. And then our next session, we're working on being systematic because that's how your organization moves through time, right? Where you have to, you kind of work your week and things get chaotic. And then at the end of the week, you have what I call my executive meeting. And then you get it all together and get it all organized again. And so, yeah, we've been having uh, a lot of fun and have some great uh, freelance writers in there. So it's a good time. And if the key is to keep that income stream coming, being systematic, I think is a huge part of that. Totally. Like doing your lead generation every week, not just like, oh, I don't have any work. So, oh, and we'll be starting yeah. the next session um, of Powerhouse Writers in January. So people who want to start a, uh, a side hustle and diversify during the recession can, uh, can check that out. There's a good holiday gift to give yourself and that's at powerhousewriters.com. Mr. Grummet, what's going on, Doc G with uh, Earn and Invest? What's coming up? So we just had Sean Mullaney on to talk about the Solo 401k. That is his book. We are not going to talk specifically about the Solo 401k, but we're going to talk in general about this idea of how do we use the tax code, all the different ways in which we can save for retirement that, you know, takes advantage of what the government allows us to do, how it allows us to defer taxes, et cetera. What are the different options? What options are good for which people? and how that can affect our long-term savings. And that's it, the Earn and Invest podcast. You know what? As uh, Doc G's talking, Doug, I was thinking, he's talking about the, the solo 401k. Oh. Maybe there's some like solo stove like yes. 401k. 
where you spend I was your... worried we were going to get through this whole episode and not talk about solo stoves. I'm so <laughs> glad you saw the, the direct correlation there. Mm-hmm. I seriously need to get that sponsorship. I need it. And I heard it on another podcast finally. So I went to Westwood One and I said, you guys got to get us a sponsorship because <clears throat> I am. I, how, much, how much money have I lost Again, already? Why pay for the cow? If you're solo <laughs> stove, <laughs> why true. would you pay for the cow? <laughs> Good, good point. Because I am, I have sold so many solo stoves. Uh, Mr. Brotman, you have a solo stove? Uh, I don't. I don't. Although uh, Doug just did refer to you as a cow. So uh, yeah, you, you, yeah, you can take that up with them later. We've known each other for a long time. I just let it go. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Just let it go. I do not have a solo stove. You get angry about the big things. You know what I mean? Uh, over time, you oh, learn absolutely. to pick your battles with your, with your work spouses. Absolutely. Yes. Hey, what's going on at Don't Retire Graduate, my friend? This has been a, a fun fifth season for us. We, we launch our season in September because we're on a school, a school calendar. And this year is our first year where we've gone to video, against my better judgment. Rather than just doing audio, my face for radio is now uh, being broadcast. And Joe, for the record, was our first guest on season five. So if you want to check out my absolute uh, rookie venture... Joe was my guest, and he took it relatively easy on me, so I appreciate that. But uh, we're having we're having a great time. We have a, a guest every other week. We put we have a new episode every Thursday, uh, and it's really been it's been a, so much fun. I love hosting the show. That's at don'tretiregraduate.com. I've been twice on your show. Yeah, and I feel like both times I come on, you're like, okay, we're done. I'm like, no, let's hang out some more. Let's hang out some more. Well, you know, half an hour is not a long time to do a show and have a great conversation with folks. And you and I, I, I'd say we could yap for hours, but we have. We just haven't done it on camera before. <laughs> that, that's true. Yeah. We have. Yeah. At oh, a yeah. bar down the street from uh, the place we had our meetup in uh, Baltimore. Correct. I'd, I'd mention the name, but then you'd be a cow again. So I, I won't, I won't <laughs> give them right. the, I'm not going to give them the, the heads up. No. No, I'm not doing it. Do not want to. And that's Don't Retire, Graduate, the podcast available where finer podcasts are. And you know what? For Don't Retire, Graduate, Earn and Invest, and for Powerhouse Writers, just head to our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. I think that's going to do it for today, guys. Uh, Doug, if I don't have it, you know who's got it? Doug has it. Doug, what should we have learned today, man? Darn right I do, Joe. First, take some advice from our team. History? While we should learn from it, remember that all downturns are different. Don't bet money that this ending will be the same as last time. Second, take it from Doc G. Much like a colostomy, whoever can hold the bag longest wins. Protect your income stream as long as possible, and you should be fine. But the big lesson? Don't ask Joe's mom about 1980, unless you want to hear her rendition of Funky Town. She, she really cannot hit the high notes that well. Uh, you know, I mean, she might make up for it with the dance moves. I don't know. Maybe you'll like it. Thanks to financial planner Eric Brotman for joining us today. You'll find Eric's podcast, Don't Retire, Graduate, wherever you're listening to us right now. We'll include links to Eric's show in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks to Doc G for hanging out with us today. While trivia usually isn't his thing, hosting an entertaining podcast is. You'll find Doc G at the Earn and Invest podcast wherever you're listening to us now as well. Big thanks to incredible writer and writing coach Paulette Peretch. Oh, I can see she wrote this. For joining us today. Speaking of Paulette, we should tell you that this show is the property of SB Podcast LLC, copyright 2022, and is written in part by the aforementioned Miss Perhatch, who helps writers power their words, their work, and their earning potential with her Powerhouse Writers Coaching Program. Find out more at powerhousewriters.com. Thanks also to our team who made today possible. Karen Repine plotted out this episode for us and schedules our guests. Brooke Miller handles the show notes and creates our amazing newsletter, The 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show and both Autumn C. High and Gertrude Smith are our social media mavens. Not only should you not take advice from these cheese bags, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only barely before making any financial decisions speak with a real financial advisor
Welcome to the after show, everybody. Uh, this is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens uh, here, Eric, in the after show stays in the after show. So we don't talk about it. If you have to talk about it, which people do from time to time, we call it dessert. But it's probably better if you let people discover this segment on their own. So I was thinking when we were joking about uh, Eric being in elementary school in uh, 1980, I was also thinking about those days and some of the just idiotic stuff I did that um, that may, may not have been the best decision. And I was wondering if you guys have some stories about uh, those. Oh, Doc G has one. So this was also in the 80s, right? I was in high school and my parents made the mistake of going out of town and leaving me alone. So I, of course, broadcast to all my friends that uh, we were having people over at my house. And the next thing I know, there were 40, 50 people in my house, alcohol everywhere, empty cans, oh, et cetera. Man. And then, of course, what happens? The police pull up. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, man. So the police pull up right at the same time my stepbrother pulls up. So I was probably... I don't know, 16, and maybe he was 18, so he was a little more senior than me, and he was, let's say, confident in the best of ways. And so he walks up to the police and somehow convinces them to go away and not ticket us and not give us any problems. I mean, literally, people had run really? out of my backyard. There's like a woods in my parents' backyard, and they ran to the woods and ended up like right by the expressway. It, it all went to Haywire. We had alcohol everywhere. The police didn't even come in the house, and they left. Crazy. What did he say? We, we, what did he say? I, I have no idea. He somehow, he's just that kind of guy. He just went and chatted them up and got them to leave. We cleaned up the house spotless. My parents come home the next day. There was like a weather van on the outside someone had knocked over. So they noticed that, but still weren't hip to the game until the next door neighbors later that night came over and asked what happened and why the cops were at our house. Oh, so, so I was busted. I thought did- I had gotten away. I had done everything. I had cleaned up. Nothing was broken besides that weather van. I thought I was in the clear. No one arrested. No fines. No tickets. Until the next door neighbor stopped by because they were those kind of nosy. I, I actually lived next door to the Joneses. I literally, the people <laughs> next door, and they had like two Bentleys. Damn Joneses. And they were also a little bit nosy neighbors. So we could not keep up with the Joneses, but apparently <laughs> they could keep up with my parents enough to come and tell them about the party I threw. Wow. Do you remember the discipline after that? So I had really permissive parents, so they didn't really discipline me. I think they they made me feel bad for a while, but then I don't think there was any major discipline. I'll go next only because mine is mine is fairly similar. This was just my brother and I. We decided that um, we really wanted to do like boxing and and, but we didn't want to hurt each other anyway. We decided to have this to have a pillow fight where we would just throw pillows at each other until somebody landed on a knee. And we would go two minutes per round and we would go 15 rounds. And by the way, you get to like round four of this thing and your <laughs> arms are just already just killing. <laughs> Mush. But of all, of all the places to do the pillow fight, we decide to do it in the living room where my mom has her collection of irreplaceable figurines, Ooh, right? Oh, She's yeah. got this huge eagle. And of course, like in round eight, my brother, I remember I miss... I miss him and I just took a big wail at his head and I just miss him. And then I turn and I see just a face full of pillow, just huge pillow hits me right in the middle of the face. And of course we learned after the first two rounds, by the way, to twist that pillow about 18 <laughs> times so that it was really just this tight pack ball. Anyway, I fell into the table. The, the figuring goes over and the wing breaks off this big thing. My parents are away for the weekend. We get super glue and my mom didn't figure it out until I'm going to say doc G 15 years later, like 15, 15. Years, 15 years later, my mom at a Thanksgiving goes, okay, how did the wing <laughs> break off of my, off of my Eagle 15 years later. <laughs> so ours was a little bit easier. We didn't have neighbors that looked in the window. Apparently Eric Paulette, Doug, Paula has no stories, I'm sure. Has none. No God. stories. I was a perfect little I'm, angel. I'm angel. figuring out which one is okay to well, share. Yeah. And, and, and my story was so much like G's, actually. But I wanted to tell him, when you're going to throw a party as a teenager, you have to invite the neighbors. If you invite oh. the neighbors, they're less likely to tell on you. And I actually had an epic one. Uh, the Thanksgiving weekend, I was 15 years old. 
Wait and a minute. I, wait a minute. I'd hold on a second. So you're saying the key to success as a high schooler yes. is to inter, is to invite the adult neighbors yes. to your high school bash. <laughs> Correct. They don't come, <laughs> Joe. Pie. They don't what? come generally. But if they do that. So, yeah, look, I was 15. It was 1986 or 87, I guess. And uh, you could get away with stuff then. It doesn't work as well now. No, kids don't have house parties now. Well, if they do, mm. they don't at my house because we don't It'll leave. all end up on We're... social media now. Correct. Oh, absolutely. But you talk about discipline. I was grounded from Thanksgiving to New Year's and was fined $500. My father fined, fined, by your fined me $500, which at $3.35 an hour at Burger King took me a darn long time to earn. So that was a painful experience. But it did make me legendary, and it made a lot of co- a lot of high school yearbooks. So because we talked parties, I need to give you another story, a quickie, because it, I feel like I should come up well, with wait something a different. No, I just got to tell you before you move on that yeah, first yeah. story is a whopper, Eric. That was a whopper. It was a whopper. Yeah, thank you. Hey, look, that's polyester mm-hmm. flattered me at the time. <laughs> so in in eighth grade, I I fancied a seventh grade girl at the pool. She was watching some some guy on the diving board, and he did a flip. And she goes, wow, did you see him? Well, I wasn't going to let that stand. I said, I can do that. Watch this. And I broke my nose in an epic, epic way, showing off for this young woman. They had to clear the pool because the pool went purple because of all the blood in the pool. Uh, and forever, forever, she and I still know one another. Thanks to social media forever. I'm the guy who broke his nose trying to prove to her that he could do a flip off the diving board. Uh, I couldn't. Mm. And it was horrible. What did you do? Clip the end of the diving board with your nose? No, no, I only went three quarters of the way around. I wasn't as aerodynamic as I expected. And I hit my my head, my face on my own knee. The knee hit the water and my face hit my knee. And I went under. And this was the era of Scooby-Doo. And if you recall, occasionally in some of those cartoons back in the 70s and 80s, a character would swallow a bar of soap <sighs> and would spit out bubbles, and you wouldn't hear what the bubbles said until, until the bubble popped. I promise you, I was on the bottom of a 12-foot section trying to see if my nose was still there, and I said, oh, I broke my effing nose. And I hope it popped at the top and people heard that across <laughs> the, whole, the whole pool. Because that's what I, I thought my nose was gone. Like, that hurt a lot. Oh, I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah, well, that sucked. Speaking of impressing girls uh, in high school, I uh, I mean, we all have the, had the high school party and we got busted. Yeah, yeah. Boring. We've all done that. <laughs> Except Paulette, maybe. <laughs> but in trying to impress a girl, I dated a girl who was a year older than me. She had gone to college down in Ohio, south of us, about, I don't know, five-hour drive, six-hour drive. And I'd already been down to visit her that fall. You know, it's young love, right? You just can't stand to be apart. So I'd already been down to visit her, I don't know, four times. And my parents were going out of town for a weekend. And I thought, perfect time for me to go down and visit her. And they expressly forbade me from going to visit her. Well, oh. I'm not letting, yeah, I'm not letting that stop me. Right. But I just thought, I got to be extra careful. So I called one of my brother's friends who had a brand new thing that had come out called a radar detector. Like, Sweet. <laughs> like this is going to guarantee me safe you passage fly. through fly. the state of Ohio Whoa. to get to university and, and hang out with my girlfriend. So I get the radar detector and there was a, another girl in my high school class who was dating a guy down there. So she hitches a ride with me. We're cruising down there and I feel like I'm bulletproof. I don't get 500 yards inside the state of Ohio when the radar detector goes berserk and I get tapped for going, I don't know, you know, 15 over, 20 over. I get pulled over and she says to me, you know, I hear in Ohio, you've got to pay the cops right in the car. Like you don't have a choice. You got to pay them right on the spot. Mm -hmm. So the guy pulls me out of the car, brings me into his car I'm terrified. I'm, you know, a teenage kid and I figure I got to pay. So what do I do? I pull out the cash out of my wallet. <laughs> Can we just make this go away? <laughs> That's what I said. I said, I, 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 I've, I've heard we can take care of this right now. Oh, my God. There's two hours of Burger King money. Yeah. This never happened. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. So I barely escaped getting cuffed right then and there. Oh my God. And, <laughs> and then he says, Well, son, if you were not a minor, you're right. We would handle this right now. 
but because you're a minor, you have to come back and go to court. Oh, oh no. Oh, mother God. of God. This is going as bad, I thought, as badly as it could go. But he says, I'm going to give you the ticket now. Be careful. Be on your way. We'll be seeing you back in the state of Ohio later. So I go on, have the weekend. It was not as fantastic as I thought it was going to be. Mm. So it, none of this was worth it. I come home every day from school for the next almost month after that. I've got football practice and skiing dry lands right after school, but I'm driving all the way home to check the mail for the ticket that's going to come in the mail <laughs> almost for a full month. And finally, I'm like, maybe they forgot about it. Maybe the whole state of Ohio just had a oh, no. major administrative collapse and they didn't <laughs> process my ticket. So I don't go home from school for one day. <laughs> and that's when the ticket showed up and I come home from from practice and there it is unfolded nicely on the dinner table waiting for me and i had to have a real fun conversation with my parents because of one day did you get fined five hundred dollars uh, i got grounded i didn't get to go see that girl at college again for like three or four months and it was pretty painful that's a lifetime they're... it's a lifetime yeah. at that age yeah well i'm sure she yeah. found somebody to hang out with doug she did. She married the guy that she hung. She started hanging out with in my absence. Because you weren't there. <laughs> oh, Eric. Well, so that was. I mean, talk about an epic fail. You broke your nose. My heart was broken, Brotman. Yeah, listen, I don't want to hear listen, about a damn nose. You can't deviate a septum that way. I don't want to. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> Paulette. <laughs> I I was trying to think of that moment where like you like first of all my my mom was very permissive my best friend's mom was permissive for example we were allowed to have the party at her house to which the cops came but we didn't care because we're like yeah she knows if we scrubbed the grout the next morning in the kitchen if we cleaned her grout for her in the next morning that was the rule so you could have like, the party if you scrub the grout we're like scrubbing and we're just like we're, we're singing like scrub the grout scrub scrub the grout now our parents are like mm, maybe that wasn't such a good idea maybe we should have had some rules but the one time i really did get in trouble was when i missed my sats because i couldn't find my license and i was like man eh, it'll probably be fine i'd already taken them once and i was just like didn't want to deal with it i hadn't studied as much as i had the first time didn't think it was like on my parents radar and oh my god they were pissed but then i couldn't oh. find my license so i couldn't even go <laughs> So one of those things where you're like, um, alert, I had ADHD at the time. And just like all the things that make you like hate yourself. And then you're like, oh, that was ADHD. Got it. Got it. So you didn't even get in the car and go. Did you just tell oh, him? No. Did you tell him then? Did you say, I can't find my license, so I'm not going? Yes. They were not happy. It was, it was no. not good. But yeah, we were, we were naughty pants. We were definitely naughty I think in that's, high school. I think that's the universal thing. None of us had happy parents. My parents weren't happy 15 years later, but the rest of you, it was much more immediate. <laughs> I'll tell you, you get good at throwing parties. Yes, you invite the neighbors. And we had developed a relationship with the local Sherwin Williams to get painting tarps to cover furniture and floors. <laughs> like we got yeah. really, really, we got really good at it. Oh my, oh my God, God, dude. Like Dexter you were like a up. pro. It was, it was a, it was epic. It was constant and it, it made me famous in all the wrong ways in certain circles. And thank goodness there were no phones, no cameras. My problem was I knew all the cops because I worked at the skating rink and they would hire like a rent a cop outside. So I'd work the door and I would just like chat with the cop all night. So when I got pulled over, when I ran stoplights, when I, you know, like when I was bad, all the times I was speeding and it just sometimes it's good to have consequences. Sometimes it's like <laughs> nice. Like that's how life works. And when you're young, you should learn that in the little ways so that you don't get hit with the reality of it later. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm just Eric, I think. um, Eric watched that fire festival documentary and went <laughs> amateurs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we, we perfected, we perfected this. I want to see pictures. I had a fake ID at 15. I couldn't even drive myself to the liquor store. Oh my God. He, sk he skateboarded. Yeah, right. <laughs>